So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Last time we did the first part of this talk, in which we went up to World War One. So I'm going to start now with the history and timeline of the gold standard, very briefly summarized. So in 1816. Great Britain officially ties the pound to a specific quantity of gold. So that's the start of the gold standard, and it also introduced a gold coin. And uh, around that time, the dollar was also defined. and uh, there was also some international meetings to make sure that the major currencies like <coughs> in europe they were valued in such a way that a uh, uh, fixed amount of uh, gold coin could be valued in francs or in pounds or in dollars in a sort of an easy way you didn't have to cut off the coin in irregular ways So in 1873 there was a law passed in the USA which basically eliminated silver as uh, so this was a bi US was on a bimetallic standard where both gold and silver were usable as currencies this kept causing problems because the ratio of the price of gold to silver fluctuated but the law had one fixed ratio so if the gold was more expensive then people would start exporting coins and melting them down for their uh, value um so one defense against that was to create token coins that is although originally the idea was that the value of the coin is equal to the value of the gold in that coin later on the there was gold content but the actual yani the the currency value of the coin was large and the gold content in it was a token just like fractional <coughs> reserve this was a so this system was introduced to prevent this gresham law from operating but anyway in 1873 what happened as a result of the uh removal of silver as money was that there was a recession because uh, one important component of money was removed from the stock of money and there was a great political disturbance because of this so in 1900 there was a gold standard act which placed us officially on the gold standard which committed the us to maintain a fixed exchange rate that is basically once you commit your dollar to a particular gold value then automatically this gives you a fixed exchange rate to all other currencies which are on a gold standard it was not specifically the exchange rate it was the tying to gold that does it and this lasted in for 19 years only until the world war 1 where both us and britain suspended the gold world war 1 started in 1914 1913 mein federal reserve came into existence in the USA and uh, it specified that you had to have 40% backing in gold and during 14 to 19 the strict gold standard was suspended in US and Great Britain during the world war so after the world war uh, there was attempt to return to the gold standard but there was not enough gold it a lot of gold had been spent so uh, in great britain they said okay we can go back to the gold standard but the gold coins will not circulate the um, you cannot use small amounts of gold there was a large uh, bar of gold which was allowed for uh, any yani if people had enough currency to buy that so this was called the gold bullion standard 
but in 1929, the Great Depression occurred and uh, there was a economic recession. So after that, it was not possible to maintain even the gold bullion standard. So in 31, the gold bullion standard was abandoned <coughs> by Great Britain. But at that time, uh, basically the um, idea in all of the European countries was that we should we have to return. Basically, you see, prior to the World War One, basically until the early 20th century, it was a economy which was based on colonizations and colonies. And basically, World War One was the outcome of the breakdown of the colonial economy. But this was not understood by anybody at that time and is still understood by very few. So the a new economy needed to emerge. Now, there was a huge amount of prosperity in Europe because they were ruling the world and they were exploiting the world. But um, so after the World War, they wanted to go back to that system. They said there was something great about the system. It was globalized. Everybody could trade with anybody. And so gold center was, the gold uh, standard was one, uh, one essential element of that. So everybody wanted to go back to that. Uh, but it was not possible for various reasons. So this is Polanyi writes, there, there was a massive effort uh, people tried to stabilize their currencies, but they tried and they failed. And, and the efforts was, you know, destroyed local economies. But, uh, so it says that they starved themselves to reach the golden shores of, and you know, there was a massive effort to try to recreate the gold standard, but it failed. Why did it fail? You see, now we have described the events but we have not described the reason for these events and that's really where the key is any understanding history doesn't give you an understanding of what is happening in economics you have to understand why these things happen and that's not on the surface so observations do not reveal the economic facts so one of the issues we'll discuss this in much greater detail later on in the lecture was that if you try to go to the gold standard, then as we have discussed in the first lecture, there was not enough gold around. So uh, there was a low money stock and if you tried to maintain your gold backing, then basically that meant that you have to live with the recession. And uh, also you can't allow deficits to grow in a gold standard, so you can't do deficit spending. So at that time, because all European economies have been destroyed, the, demo the economic demand for the domestic economy was that you need to have an expansionary mo money policy and you need to fund investment by using deficit spending because you c there was no money around. The governments did not have revenue. So, uh, generally speaking, this is a... However, uh, this goal, expansionary money s policy and deficit spending was not compatible with gold standard. So most people chose austerity and uh, that is what he meant by. So austerity means keeping your budget low, keeping your money tight, destroying your dis domestic economy in order to get maintain the gold standard, st stable foreign exchange rate. Germany went to the opposite extreme. They, that is why they had a hyperinflation. Now you see, you have to understand that we study hyperinflation in macroeconomics. We, st we study Kagan and how increasing money supply led to hyperinflation. But this really doesn't get to the understanding. Why was why did Germany start printing money like mad? This is a not a sensible, there's no answer to that in there. I mean, so basically the thing is that there were two choices. Either you choose to have stable exchange rates or you uh, prefer your domestic economy. Now, for various reasons, uh, Germany preferred the domestic economy. They, they, they didn't have uh, much to gain from trade for various reasons. And they also had this theory that um, 
you should print money to meet the needs of the economy so basically however much money is needed by the domestic economy that is the amount of money that the central bank should supply but now this created a, a self spiral because the needs expanded and so to meet the expanding need the banks printed more money and that uh, created more inflation which expanded the needs so the bank printed even more money and that completely basically delinked see this massive destability meant that nobody could do any trading with germany in tr with the currency of germany because the currency of germany was unreliable so uh, it uh, so basically it's a issue of domestic economy versus international trade and so germany chose the trade route and it chose high deficits and expansionary money as opposed to and and basically isolated itself so these were the choices that were facing economies and why people made choices for that you have to study the domestic economic conditions you cannot learn it by calculating solutions to differential equations so after the um world war and after the great depression the in 1933 there was a us banic bank ban bank banking panic uh which was basically you know after shocks of the great depression there were multiple banking uh crises after the great depression in the uh usa 1929 so uh, f uh fdr franklin delano, delano roosevelt uh prohibited the private holding of gold so basically he um said uh, he he made a law in which everyone whether private or company anyone who had gold they had to give it to the government at official rates and the government would give them dollars so but nobody was allowed to hold gold it was a crime and in 1934 the us government took title to all monetary gold it halted minting of gold coins gold certificates could be held by the federal reserve bank only even people could not hold gold certificates the us went on a limited gold bullion standard limited means that uh, gold could only be redeemed by foreign central banks and by a few licensed users FDR also devalued gold uh, uh devalued the dollar by increasing the price from 22 to 35 dollars per ounce and he also shut down all the US gold mines i don't know why exactly but basically he said that gold is no longer important and you should mine more uh, more other things so <coughs> from 1933 to uh onwards basically the gold uh, standard was uh, failing to work the us went off it and the uh uk went off it they tried to reestablish it didn't work so people started to think of what how to handle the uh international transactions without a gold standard because this is now a serious question as i explained in the first lecture the domestic economy works by fiat money by sovereign law but for trade you have to have consensus you have to have some agreement on what we will do with surplus because either you barter or if you have currency then you need to know what foreigners can do with your currency for that you need laws and consensus so basically the bretton woods agreement uh came to such an agreement that okay gold standard is no longer there but uh there was a gold exchange standard this was the basically the idea was that the every currency would be backed by a notional value of gold and if uh, other countries acquired your currency they could get in principle gold in return for that 
the um, however the IMF was set up in order to prevent this from happening for the most part I mean the gold was only the last resort basically you would try to even out these temporary imbalances instead of requiring gold movement set and so basically this meant that you know, because there was a notional gold standard that the exchange rates were stabilized and the one of the rules was that any change would have to be notified and approved by the IMF before it could be enacted, change in the gold standard or change in the exchange rates. And in principle, foreign countries could cash their surplus in currencies of other countries for gold at the notional rates, although IMF was designed to try to make sure that this wouldn't happen too often. And uh, what happened was that uh, because basically dollar was considered to be the soundest currency at that time, nobody else had enough uh, gold in comparison to USA. So that became the de facto standard in the sense that people would, uh, you know, US guaranteed that it would uh, convert dollars to gold at the official rate if foreign central banks presented it with the demand. Uh, and so dollar was considered to be as good as gold and then dollar was used in place of gold. So there was a monetary policy uh, requirement by the IMF that you have to keep a monetary policy that the exchange rate remains stable to within a fixed value plus or minus one percent. But um, the this didn't work very well. In 45, the gold backing of the reserve notes was reduced by 25.5%. Uh, although in principle, they didn't change the, uh, the dollar value of gold because now the dollar value of gold was notional. Only central banks could cash it and it wasn't, uh, you couldn't actually use dollars to buy gold within the country. and. And everybody knew that if we present a large amount of dollars to the USA, we don't know what will happen. I mean, technically they are legally obliged, but whether they will honor this obligation or not, nobody knew. In 1954, the London gold market reopened. In 1961, Americans were forbidden to own gold abroad, even at home. Uh, so basically, um, any efforts, there, there was serious doubt about how a currency system would work without gold. Nobody actually knew. Uh, nobody wanted to float currencies like they do. I mean, that, that was one suggestion, but nobody thought this was a viable system actually. People thought that this system would never work, floating currencies. So there was a very strong concern to maintain fixed exchange rates. Nobody knew exactly how we can do that without gold. With gold it was clear, everybody denotes their value in gold and then the currency exchange rates are automatically fixed. So there was uh, these efforts going on to keep or reinstate the gold standard and this is part of these efforts. The central bank got together and said that okay, we will buy and sell gold at a fixed price at the London gold. So even if the US does not exchange uh, the central bank, there's, there's this alternative way to uh, convert into gold. And even the existence of this facility will create the stability. It doesn't, you don't have to, as, as we know in the fractional reserve, you don't actually have to go and claim dollars. As long as somebody says that I will redeem your this currency for gold, this is enough to give, create the confidence which will require the gold, gold standard to operate. So this was one of the goals of this gold market. However, in uh, this, uh, in 1968 people said, okay, there's this gold market, let's go and try it. When the disparity become high and they went into cash, there was sudden surge in demand and sudden uh, there was not enough gold to meet it, it was just a confidence ploy, so they shut it down. <coughs> and then the governors of the gold pool said that they will no, no longer buy and sell gold. 
So a two-tier pricing system emerged. Official transactions between central banks were conducted at this $35 per ounce price, but other trans transactions were fluctuating free market price. And uh, the U.S. Mint uh, terminated the policy of buying gold and selling gold to certain licensed holders of gold. And gold backing of Federal Reserve notes was eliminated. In 1971, there was the Nixon shock. Basically, this happened because de Gaulle uh, either did or threatened to do send, they had a large stock of dollars. Basically, you see, it was all due to the Vietnam War, which caused an enormous amount of overspending in dollars. So, US dollars were held in large quantities by foreign countries and de Gaulle who was not very friendly to USA at that time. French president said? Ah, French president said that I will cash my dollars for gold and basically I don't know whether he did it or whether he threatened to do it but basically Nixon announced that we will no longer convert dollars to gold. So that basically ended the Bretton Woods agreement. And now um, dollar, which was already being used as the reserve currency, but the idea was that the dollar is actually a token for gold because dollar can in principle be cash for gold at $35. Now no, no longer a dollar was purely dollar, nothing else. Um, US devalued the dollar by raising the official price, but it also and he terminated the link to gold worth, saying that we are not going to convert dollars for gold. But this was again a <coughs> notional price. On 1973, there was another devaluation, uh, raised the dollar price to $42. And uh, basically, uh, that was still too high, and he, the actual gold value of dollar was, um, and do there was a surplus of dollars on the market and people st started to sell dollars and finally the um, currencies were allowed to float freely without regard to the price of gold because that was uh, no longer possible to maintain. Market price for gold rose to $120, triple the price. So you see, this was huge disparity. You could not any maintain a system with, which in which the currencies were trading trading at an official gold value when the value of gold was triple the amount. So it was just a clearly artificial system which didn't work. So. There was a, in the 70s there was a, I was actually there, there, there was a huge amount of fear that if floating exchange rates come about then international trade will completely break down and then um, uh, that will cause a um, lot of damage to the global economy and uh, actually there was an interesting incident when uh, the Hunt brothers, Bunker Hunt and somebody else, decided to corner the world market for silver because they thought that the world will go back to metallic currencies after trying floating exchange rates and failing. And gold was too expensive, but they had enough money to try to capture all of the silver in all of the world. And they tried and they almost succeeded. It was basically the Federal Reserve that uh, actually uh, yani, uh, took steps to prevent them from doing this that caused them to fail otherwise they had con cornered all the they had purchased all of the silver in the world I heard that they filled their swimming pools with silver <laughs> <laughs> it's possible so um, In the 70s, the, mm, there was a dollar was weak and people uh, started becoming interested in gold which also weakened the dollar further. So in the 
by act of Congress, there was no official price and the gold was delinked uh, completely. And also the U.S. took steps to strengthen the dollar by creating the petrodollar, but that's a separate story. Basically, it bribed and persuaded the OPEC countries to make sure that all oil price sales would be done in gold. So now, instead of being backed by gold, the U.S. dollar is backed by petrol, which is a very solid backing. So the floating exchange rates caused a lot of uh, turbulence in the markets. Gold went to $870 in one day <coughs> and closed at 591 In 1981, there was a gold commission to see if we should go back to gold. 1987, there was a sharp decline in gold markets and basically over this period of time gold acted in a counter cyclical way yani, uh, currencies and, and stocks uh, gold was a, a reserve so if people were afraid of the what was happening in the real world they would jump to gold and so the gold prices acted in the way that was opposite to the what was happening in the real world. So if the economy was strong, gold was weak. If the economy was weak, gold was strong. So it acted as a good hedge. Was there any role of the gold extraction also? Yes, there was a role of gold extraction and the amount of gold supplies <coughs> did make a difference. Um, California gold rush and many other things happened uh, which affected the supply of gold and that did have some effects. Yeah, in 1990, the U.S. became the, they reopened the gold mines and they became the second largest gold producing nation. In 1999, because of the, basically the realization that with the dollar being the core currency, the U.S. can impose a tax on the rest of the world without doing anything. So at least the European economies said that we should protect ourselves from this and they created this euro protect themselves from the dollar hegemony. Now the European economies by themselves were too small to actually compete with the dollar so they collaborated to create this. In 2002 Gold Institute was dissolved. In 2010 in Zelik who was at the World Bank he said that we should go back to the gold standard and uh, Robert Mundell has also been advocating women. So there are some few eccentrics who are still proposing gold standard. Also Islamic economists who understand the failure of the international financial system, they also propose that we should go back to gold. But this is not a viable system as we've discussed. So <coughs> those are just the broad events. We will not get an understanding of these events. But I wanted you to have a geographical <coughs> landscape. Now I'm going to study the um, paper that we are planning to. This is a paper by Barry Eichengreen on um, Nerske in international financial architecture. He analyzes the lessons that Ragnar Nerske derived from the international currency experience in the post-war period to see how well they hold up today. <coughs> So these, these lessons are not immediately directly applicable because they are working in the gold standard era, but many of them have important counterparts today. So I'll just go through this paper. It's a very short paper and it goes through lesson by lesson. And it's these lessons which explain the experience. And after you understand the experience, then, then you can go back to history and then you can understand why this happened. Otherwise you can see, oh, this happened and that happened, but why did it happen? You have no idea. I also, because especially if you go in with these wrong macroeconomic theories, then you simply cannot understand what is happening because uh, the wrong economic theories teach you exactly the wrong lessons. And for example, the RBC model says that banks have no difference and credit makes no difference. So 
all of these things, the things which are most important are not part of the mainstream theory. And even recently at a meeting at the State Bank Monetary Policy Commission, the uh, people from research department said that our model says this, this and this. So other people said that your model doesn't even have banks and money, so how can you say anything about money policy? <laughs> Which was true actually. <coughs> All right, so we are going to the lesson. Now, this is all about understanding the experience. So the first lesson is that there was a major difference between the pre-war period and the post-war period. And what were, uh, and, and basically all of the Nerske paper is about what are the differences. So the first difference is that there was a decline of confidence in central banks. Now, what does this mean? This doesn't mean exactly what it seems to mean. Basically, pre-World War I, the central world banks were willing to do everything and anything to maintain stable exchange rate, including, very importantly, to sacrifice the domestic economy. If unemployment is high, let it be. <coughs> uh, it is more important to maintain the stable exchange rates. Now, this is actually a class conflict. Yeah? Basically, the wealthy financial elites are multinational and they are not hurt by high unemployment at home, just like uh, in the recent uh, crisis and post crisis unemployment has hurt the public but the elite have uh, kept increasing their share and their income about over the past 10 years about 85 percent of all the GNP gain has gone into the hands of the top one percent so they don't care they're not concerned that rulers and the wealthy and the they are not concerned about domestic unemployment that hurts the population but in post-1920 era, this was no longer true. The uh, maintaining a stable exchange rate was no longer the highest priority of the central banks because the economies had been completely destroyed. So now uh, the Bank of England uh, refused to rate, raise interest to protect the pounds because it realized that if I raise interest, this will cause problems with domestic credit and with supply of credit being reduced, the domestic investment will be reduced and so the domestic economy will be harmed. Whereas in the past, maintaining the value of the dollar was higher priority than that, but in the, in the post-war era, uh, restoring the domestic economy became a greater concern. <coughs> so because of this, uh, the central bank behavior changed. So in the pre-19 pre-war era, if there was a weak currency, then the central bank would take steps to protect it, it would increase the interest rate. So the capital flows went in the right direction. If the company, uh, if the currency is weak, then uh, because uh, people would anticipate that yes, now the central bank is going to take steps to protect this currency, so they would buy that currency and strengthen that currency. Uh, now, so in the pre-war area, the capital flows were stabilizing for the exchange rates. But in the post-war here, the opposite happened. If a currency weakened, then the central bank would face a choice between trying to strengthen the cur currency or trying to protect the local economy. And now it might go in the other way. If so, uh, the uh, destabilizing the capital flows became destabilizing because they thought that, okay, the currency is weakening, the central bank might actually uh, take steps to change the exchange rate peg. And then the currency will weaken further, <coughs> so we should get out while we can. <coughs> so foreign investors, foreign holders of the currency would actually move to further destabilize a weak currency because they thought that the central bank may not protect the currency. So in this new environment, uh, there were only two options. Either you allow more exchange rate flexibility, you can't uh, maintain and fix a peg, or you go for monetary union as happened in the European Union later, so that this problem doesn't arise. 
so uh, the article cites the example that uh, depending on what the central bank decides to do, that governs the direction of the ca capital flow. So he says in the European Union, there was a time when Euro, 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 the euro was sliding very heavily in the world markets. And so Mario Draghi, he was the central euro, uh, central bank governor, he said that we will take do whatever it takes to defend the euro. And so once he announced that, then suddenly the capital flows changed. Instead of selling dollars, people started to buy dollars. So <coughs> just this one announcement that this is our policy changed the... So how much, how, how important confidence in central banks is and, and what people think their policy is, is uh, <coughs> essential. All right, so the second lesson. <coughs> Uh, if the central bank uh, lacks credibility, that, then the efforts to defend PEG may be worse than useless. The balance of payment fluctuates randomly. Some cu currencies are going up, some are going down. So if um, uh, you have an adverse balance of payment, lots of pounds have flowed out. So you might say that, okay, we can attract uh, domestic uh, attract people to buy sterling by raising the interest rate. So, <coughs> suppose the Central Bank of England raises the interest rates because it sees that there are too many dollars abroad, too many sterling, pound sterling abroad. So now this gives a signal to the people that the bank is worried about the, uh, <coughs> the sterling balance of pay payment position. So if they are worried, they are weak. So, we should get out of sterlings instead of buying sterlings. So, and especially because the bank is not going to protect the exchange rate. It's going to protect the domestic economy. So, <coughs> <coughs> similarly, if the exchange rate falls, it gives a similar signal. And so, yeah, in the pre-war era, if the exchange rate fell, then um, uh, people would uh, uh, think that the central bank is going to take steps to restore the exchange rate. But now the people think that uh, they are going to protect the domestic economy, so <coughs> they might actually and take this as a signal of weakness and sell more than before it falls further. So this leads to a standard phenomenon which is known as overshooting. Once the exchange rate starts to fall, it falls way below the equilibrium level before coming back to equilibrium. Well known observed phenomena. Uh, <coughs> there was a um, George Soros who uh, created a quantum fund and uh, attacked the Bank of England and basically the Bank of England raised the interest rates to try to protect the pound uh, against uh, the attack and uh, this started causing harm to the domestic economy. Uh, investments dried up. And so, Bank of England was faced with the dilemma, either they protect the pound or they uh, protect the domestic economy and ultimately they decided to protect the pound and uh, Soros gained um, about 60 billion dollars because of the, he had speculated heavily that this is what is going to happen and the Bank of England was helpless to protect and it could have protected it but then it would have caused massive damage to the domestic economy. <coughs> so basically this leads to the famous trilemma of uh, monetary policy which was formalized by Eichen Green in, in Globalizing Capital, although other people have also mentioned it, that countries can have only two out of three things. One is a democratic political system. If you have a democratic political system, then the monetary policy will be conducted to favor the domestic economy, but then it cannot have stable exchange rates. <coughs> now, the third thing is international capital mobility. If you freeze capital flows, then you can have both of these things that, okay, um, I have stable exchange rate, there is huge amount of surplus demand for my currency but nobody can buy it 
and similarly any as long as you have capital controls then you can <coughs> protect your currency and but if you have capital controls then and and you want to fa favor your domestic economy then your exchange rates will fluctuate so you can't have all three of these things <coughs> So basically the third insight of Ragnar Nerske is that the interwar system broke down because the central banks failed to play by the rules. Now we have to understand what these rules mean. The pre-war rules were precisely that um, if there is capital outflow and inflow then uh, this causes, yani, this changes the domestic money supply. It can either and if there's inflows, it can create inflation. If it is outflow, it can create recession. Now, uh, the central bank can do one of two things. Either it can let this happen. Uh, so it uh, allows the domestic economy to suffer. In that case, uh, it can protect the exchange rate. Um, or it can do the other thing, it can sterilize the capital flows. So if it, um, if your money supply is expanding, then you can remove money from the domestic economy and keep the money supply at the right level. So if you do that, then your domestic economy will be protected from the effects of inflows and outflows, but now your exchange rate, you cannot maintain stability. <coughs> So, <coughs> the pre-war period was that uh, they tried to step, uh, they tried to en uh, ensure that the uh, exchange rates are stable, and they did not sterilize capital flows. So that means that they sacrificed the concern of the domestic economy to allow for free capital flows and stable exchanges. This is two parts of the trilemma. That if you keep, if you allow free cap financial flow and stable exchange rates, which is the, which was the goals of the central bank, then you have to allow the domestic country uh, economy to suffer. The money supply is no longer under your control. It will be governed by the capital flow. So if you allow that, then you can maintain stable exchange rates. So nurse case said that if you look at the balance sheets of the central banks, then you see that if they have large holdings of foreign assets, the net foreign assets is large, then the net domestic eco assets will move in the opposite direction. And if the net domestic assets grow large, then they will remove the net foreign assets and let them move in the opposite direction so that the overall financial assets are the same. And this is called sterilization. So he said that post-war, you see sterilization on a large scale. Pre-war, there was no sterilization. But he didn't have access to the data <coughs> on the pre-war period. He just So somebody, Bloomfield, came in and said that, look, that's wrong. You can see the same pattern of sterilization in the <coughs> pre-war period. So for a while, there was a large controversy in monetary policy. Is, is it true or is it not? So finally, Pippinger reconciled the evidence. He said that in the short run, the pre-war era, the central banks did sterilize. They didn't want an immediate shock to the economy. Uh, but in the long run, they moved to, uh, to accommodate the flow. So they allowed the, so they, they didn't allow instantaneous shock to the economy, but they allowed, they spread it out over a long period. So that gave a deeper and more sophisticated understanding of the pre-war gold standard that they, should, they, they allowed, so, so they, they stabilized the exchange rate, but over the long run, in the short run, they, they sterilized shocks to the domestic economy, but in the long run, they allowed this shock to go through to the economy. So basically, Nerske was right. <coughs> and the fourth uh, observation of Nerske was that in the post-war era, there was strong deflationary pressure on central banks. Basically, the global supplies of gold had been depleted because of the wars. And uh, the 
central banks were trying to go back to the pre-war era so they were using values of gold which were very unrealistic like you know forty dollars instead of hundred twenty dollars when the great britain went back on the gold standard Keynes said that this price is too low you should not uh, you should not price gold at this value but the People said that, no, we have to go back to the pre-war gold standard to maintain our credibility, to show that we are as strong, but they were not. <coughs> so, yeah, there was increase in the central bank demand for reserves because the post-war um, situation was much different from the pre-war situation. Gold had been drained and there was the uh, short supply of reserves in the central banks and then uh, there was asymmetric shocks occurring in the balance of payments uh, basically you see that in the colonial system there was not that much global trade but now the colonial system had broken down and so the currency flows were much more volatile there was much more trade and uh, because of the large volume of trade, uh, these random shocks kept occurring. <coughs> and also, there was a large amount of volatility in capital flows for reasons that we will see. For all of these reasons, the precautionary central bank demand for reserves was higher than it was in the pre-war period. So the central bank wants, if the central bank wants to keep higher reserves, then your um, uh, uh, you will have a deflationary pressure because this increases the demand for gold. So if the demand for gold is high, the value of money is uh, yani and and money is backed by gold then the basically the supply of money will be limited to the amount of gold that you have and so the supply will not be able to match the needs of the economy which is what deflationary pressure means one more observation which is important is that uh, reserves uh, were not very useful for balance of payment and exchange rate control Actually, and you're holding a lot of reserves in order to protect your currency from attack. But, as the nurse case said, the value of the reserve was less than meets the eye for many reasons. Because, first, well, one thing that was that uh, you have to hold a certain fraction of your currency in reserve, so you can't use those reserves. If you if you have a if you have reserves which match, and you suppose you're supposed to maintain 10% of your currency in gold reserve. So if you have 10% gold, then you can't use that reserve for any other person because of legal requirements to maintain reserves. So that's statutes. But more importantly, if you started using that reserve to um, handle balance of payment problem, then this was taken as a sign of weakness in the market. <coughs> so once you have show weakness, then people attack your currency. Uh, uh, not so much attack as they say okay dollar, pound is weak we better move out of this to dollars or to francs or to some other currency which is strong so <coughs> that intensifies the pressure on your currency and intensifies the demand for reserves so <coughs> in the pre-war period central banks would often temporarily suspend payments in gold they say okay right now, now we don't have enough gold so we are suspending gold and we will resume it. So this didn't cause much problems because people were confident that banks will go back to <coughs> playing gold. But in the post-war period, uh, this was not true. If you suspended gold payments, then you might never go back or you might go back at a lower rate. So there was no, so basically this created a lack of confidence. So again, lack of confidence was a se severe problem. So, um, Eichen Green is saying that similar things happen today. When the cri uh, crisis occurred in 2008, 
the Bank of Korea had reserves of 200 billion and it did not want to allow the reserves to fall below this because it was afraid that it would come under attack if it had, didn't have enough dollar reserves. <coughs> and the Bank of China didn't want the reserves to go below 2.8 trillion US dollars. Even though IMF had calculated that this is the maximum amount needed for them to be safe. And even the, you know, the ceiling of the safe reserve as calculated by IMF was their minimum target. They didn't want it to allow. So basically the dilemma is that you cannot use your reserves when you need them the most. Because when you use reserves, you signal weakness. <coughs> and that causes further decline. So, Nerske suggested that what we need to do is to use currency swaps. So, if you use currency swaps, then you retain the same amount of reserves, but it's in different currencies, and that could uh, be one way. And also it says that IMF should provide credits to countries to allow you to go over these problems. You ha I have the reserves, but I can't use them without signaling weakness. So, if the IMF gives you a loan, and if that's not taken as a weakness, then mm -hmm. that might work. <coughs> the sixth uh, lesson is that there was no mechanism for international liquidity. Basically, what needed to be done in the post-war period was that move the price of gold from $40 to $120. And then uh, the gold reserves will be enough for everybody. So basically, but there was no mechanism to coordinate to do this. Countries were doing this on their own, but that caused a massive, uh, they were discoordinated, haphazard devaluations. And that was uh, basically justified the fear of floating in the sense that you're trying to reach this equilibrium, which is way over there, but by uncoordinated individual actions. So that's very uh, damaging. Uh, every at every step you uh, suffer damage. If, if you people could got get together and make a common decision that okay, from today all currencies will be worth only one third of the cost of gold. There will be no difficulty. Uh, basically, gold price will rise. There will be a massive surplus acquired by holders of gold. They will be very happy there. But otherwise, the international system would be uh, working. It's it's like the <coughs> so today we have the same problem that there is no mechanism to control international liquidity which is desperately needed the US which became the central currency had this problem that domestic monetary policy and the needs of the global system were in conflict and US often preferred domestic policy needs for its dollar policy and ignored the global implications. <coughs> so, the system, there was a system in effect in the 50s and 60s, the Britain Woods, but it never worked. The pre-approval of changes were required, but nobody ever notified IMF that we are going to change our exchange rates. IMF was supposed to issue SDRs to prevent these problems, but the supply of SDRs never kept up uh, with pace with the global economy. Special drawing rights, these were uh, made, supposed to be provide international liquidity, but they didn't. And then there was the post-Nixon shock where the U.S. got support for its dollar in, in petroleum, but the effects of this were never understood and still are not understood very well by people. <coughs> so, seventh very important point. <coughs> is that liquidity was supplied in a pro-cyclical manner. This is both a domestic economy problem and an international liquidity problem. In the domestic economy, because a lot of liquidity is created by private banks, so private banks create credit in a pro-cyclical manner. When the business cycle is going strong, then they create a lot of credit, and then the business cycle is at the bottom when your economy is suffering from recession, then they shrink the supply of credit which is natural according to private needs, but not uh, in accordance with the needs of the economy. And the needs of the economy are that when the economy is going into a boom, you should cut the money supply to prevent the inflation 
and when the economy is in recession then you should expand the money supply but the private system actually works in the opposite way <coughs> so <coughs> uh, this uh, exacerbates makes the business cycle worse may it may may even create business cycles so now the real business cycle model just uh, sets up a differential equation when i was in graduate school we studied these differential equation models and basically why is there a business cycle because if you have a 2 by 2 or a higher order differential equation system then your roots can be complex and when you have complex roots then the solutions show cyclical behavior so this is what we were taught this is completely an absurd i mean <laughs> what does this have to do with business cycles i mean this is what we were told in, in our macroeconomics classes that this is why business cycles happens because three by three systems have complex uh, roots and what what nonsense i mean business cycles happen because you have these uh, pro cyclical monetary expansions by the private banking system <coughs> the the si what is the role of banks when uh, there is recovery period yeah when there is recovery then the banks start expanding credit and that's um well basically this is the, all of this is minsky and minsky is building on keynes and this is stuff that we need to understand but right now we're uh, just i'm just hinting at these things now actually going into this so that's domestic liquidity international liquidity also acts like this that uh, when there is a boom then the banks are the central banks are uh, comfortable they don't need lots of reserves and so they can expand money supply and again this causes problem and again when there is a crisis then the banks want to hold reserves precautionary reserves to against currencies but this is against in conflict with the needs of the domestic economy so the eighth thing is that in the post pre war era there was only one reserve currency that was the pound sterling it was supreme after the um world war there were multiple reserve currencies there were uh, french francs deutsche marks uh, sterlings and dollars these were all used as currencies <coughs> and uh, foreign uh, yani capital flow was very free because actually basically one thing that people don't understand is that really amazing level of globalization had been achieved in the early 20th century i mean um keynes write us about this sometime that you could a person sitting in england could buy stocks in uh, south african mines and feel quite comfortable and safe and people in italy were buying stocks in american uh, railroads and things like that i mean there was massive globalization and uh, currencies you could you could convert from one currency to another without any risk but so post war this system still existed though, but it was no longer functioning to help it was functioning to hurt people now were using this to uh, hop from one currency when they felt that one currency is in danger they would hop to the other currency but this caused further dis destabilization of a system which was already weak so there is some extrapolation from this that if there is a system which emerges of usd euro and renminbi this will be dangerously unstable but i can green who's writing this paper he says that i don't think this is necessarily the case he says that in the past we i can uh, describe that there are multipolar systems which have been stable so depending on conditions it's not necessarily true that automatically multipolar systems are unstable um he talks about how central banks have to coordinate with each other in order to prevent to create stability it can, if if everyone acts individually this will be unstable the ninth lesson is that the central country uh has special responsibility the center needs to create global liquidity it has to is it has to any yani, look to the needs of the global economy it cannot act with sole concern for the its own economy as the us did in the post war period so he looks at the uh, us and uk post depression experience so the usa post depression said that okay forget about the global economy i'm just uh, we are suffering 
and so they imposed the smooth tally tariffs to protect the domestic economy and they did many other things to protect the and and this caused actually not only damage to the global economy it caused also damage to the US the US suffered the most uh, deepest effect of recession as opposed to this the UK even though it was also suffering from recession it it kept its economy open open especially in the sterling area which was the colonial economy it did not create any it had it had been a free trade area and it remained a free trade area even in the uh, uh, recession and that uh, that uh, caused the recession uk to be milder so there are basically three major uh, issues in global economy one is confidence which we have mentioned one is liquidity which we have mentioned and the third issue is adjustment what how do things adjust now if you have fixed exchange rate there's no adjustment but now we need to move towards <coughs> more adjustment so um so there are two problems with adjustment and these have not been solved the adjustment problem how do we uh, basically uh, balance of payments problems lead to changes in the exchange rate but these do not have the expected impact um it is not necessarily true that if your exchange rate weakens then your balance of payment position will improve as you know Tepur Rahman has shown in the case of Pakistan that weakening of rupee does not lead to improvement in the balance of payment position so um this leads to a dilemma that how do we get how do we make the adjustment in the proper way what should the adjustment be also the pressure to adjust is asymmetric the country which is in deficit has faces pressure to adjust the country which is in surplus does not face any pressure and this is also a problem with the system because if uh, the load was of adjustment was shared equally by an international system it could easily be managed but if all the load is put put on the weak country which is what happens then you have serious problems the strong country doesn't face any pressure even though the, it should be actually the opposite it should be the strong country which should face the difficulty of adjustment because it has the reserves to do so but so the current system is asymmetric and uh, biased and this can be fixed with international consensus but there is no consensus so the 11th lesson was that uh, countries tried to manage their economy by devaluing because these led to but these were uh, a lose lose proposition uh this reduces imports and ex uh, expand i mean you're trying what you're trying to do by devaluation is that you're trying to make you expand your export because you're trying to stimulate your domestic economy so you want to increase aggregate demand for your product so you say okay i devalue world demand for my product will increase because my, my products are cheaper also domestic demand for uh foreign products will decrease and that will be substitute there, there will be import substitution so that should stimulate my economy but if the other company also country also devalues then all of this is wiped out so this is an illusionary demand so this is a lose lose uh, and if i try to devalue and you also devalue then uh, everybody loses so nerski actually says that um he uh, actually what i can green is saying is that it is commonly thought that nerski said this but actually what nerski said was more sophisticated than that he says the he said that nerski said two things he said that one no country ever recovered from the great recession except by taking two steps which is a uh, three steps they went off gold because gold was tying them to a standard which was impossible to maintain uh, they allowed depreciation and they uh, ran expansionary mo monetary policies all three of these were required now is this a lose lose proposition he said that in some cases depreciation can be win win uh, you have to look at the circumstances if depreciation causes an expansion in uh, in domestic production and either it can also cause an expansion in foreign production but even if not if the aggregate effect is positive on global production then it is uh, it is not a lose lose proposition now 
the twelfth proposition is that you had fixed exchange rates and these led to when when you have when you're trying to control the exchange rate then you have to restrict basically one way to understand the trilemma which is actually more enlightening is that suppose i want to have stable exchange rates to support international trade and suppose i want to have uh, support my domestic economy which is also essential in a democracy or in any country which is responsive to the needs of the public as opposed to the responsible to the needs of the upper elite suppose i have these two requirements then i cannot allow free movement of capital this is the i think correct way to understand the trilemma instead of saying that these these three things and we can have to choose two i have to i would say that these two are important we have to maintain stable exchange rate in order to have a a viable trading system and we have to support the domestic economy we can't allow uh, foreign exchange to uh, affect our domestic monetary policy so given that we have these two then we must have controls on capitals this is the correct way to understand the trilemma you cannot allow free movement of capital in this in this situation so means that you need to construct barriers and this is what was done to protect exchange rates so the post war experience uh, showed that the fear of floating was justified in the sense that um free floating caused massive amount of damage and it was not allowed actually for that reason so what the central banks had to do was they had to manage the floating if you look at what's happening in the stock market <clears throat> and then you see that you cannot allow the currency to fluctuate in th that wild a fashion because uh lots of things depend on having stable exchange rates so all central banks actually manage floating there is no free floating we call it free floating the banks respond to market pressure but they smooth out local transaction uh, local changes and they should and they need to <clears throat> so one of the things is that breakdown of gold standard was in at that time nobody had in mind a freely floating exchange rates and they they did not want to have they want to pegged or controlled or something the idea that exchange rate can be allowed to float freely was not acceptable to anyone and nobody thought that this was a viable system so a consequence of this you're almost done the floating exchange rate did not lead to fall in reserve requirements this is everybody thought that you see if you have free floating exchange rates then the central bank doesn't need to have any reserves of anything because Uh, let the open market decide we do i don't need to control the currency so i don't need any foreign exchange the it's now but this did not happen actually the post war in the floating era the central banks maintained the same level of reserves as pre war sometimes even more because it, they need the reserves in order to manage the float so um post bretton woods uh, this historical experience was forgotten and people predicted that now the central banks will not hold any reserves uh, but uh, it didn't happen so, uh, post war again we have free floating exchange rates but we have reserves and non reserves is a serious problem not having enough reserves so this is the last slide that what we need is a better international system we need to have agreements on exchange rates and how they are going to be set and how they are going to be exchanged it should not be left to the whims of the market we need to have agreements on devaluations and appreciations what are the circumstances because temporary flows and speculative attacks are common and these cause serious problems and these should not these interfere with the uh with the domestic economies in harmful ways we need to have basically consensus on suitable restrictions for capital flows now there is generally because it's been recognized that free capital flows has caused a lot of damage to the economy so economists generally are in agreement that capital flows should not be free so but what are the restrictions that should be determined with international consensus and there is as yet no consensus and it is clear that i mean imf has a role to provide emergency credits because transitionally 
random shocks are going to happen. It needs to be smoothed out and IMF was designed to do this and it still has this role but so far it has not functioned in the way that it is supposed to. So, all right, so that's all for today's lecture.